السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر والله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهدوا لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة الحمد لله تفرد بالربوبية وأبان للإنسانية دلائل الألوهية أحمده تعالى وأشكره على ما أسدى من منة وعطية ودفع من نقمة وبلية وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له أنقذنا بالبعثة المحمدية من براثن الإشراك والوثنية وأعزنا بالتوحيد وأبطل مسالك الجاهلية وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمدًا عبد الله ورسوله هادي البرية ومعلم البشرية ومجدد الحنيفية صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه الذين أشادوا صروح الحنيفية وأعلوا منار الملة المصطفوية والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا 
يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما My dear brothers and sisters Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَالَّذِينَ اهْتَدَوْ زَادَهُمْ هُدًا وَآتَاهُمْ تَقْوَاهُمْ Those people who are guided, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases them in guidance. He gives them more guidance and He gives them their piety. He makes them from the people of taqwa. We learn from this that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows when a person is sincerely in search for the truth. And for a person who is sincere and has a pure heart and is seeking what is correct and what is true, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant guidance to these people. And there's so many incidents in history where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided people who were in circumstances where it amazes us that guidance reached them. The means through which guidance reached these people. Some of these stories are absolutely amazing. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes to guide a person, nothing can stop that guidance from reaching that person. So when a person has a good heart, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring guidance to that person no matter where he is or no matter what his situation is. And some of the greatest examples of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leading the sincere ones to his guidance can be found in the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with them all. And perhaps the single most amazing journey towards the truth that was taken by a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his path to guidance and how he ended up becoming a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, perhaps the most amazing story is the story of the great companion Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu. His journey from Zoroastrianism to Christianity to Islam, from land to land to land, is one of the most fascinating stories that has ever been recorded in history. Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu, he was born and brought up in Asbahan, which is in modern-day Iran. He was from a village that was known as the village of Jay. And the father of Salman was the chief of that village. So he came from an influential, well-off family. And his father, the father of Salman, he was in charge of the fire that was kept in that village. So each village had a fire that these people believed should be kept lit 24 hours a day. These fires should not extinguish. They were fire worshippers. So this was one of their religious beliefs. So Salman's father was in charge of the fire of that village to make sure that it never goes out. And eventually when Salman became a little bit older, his father gave this responsibility to him. So Salman was in charge of keeping that fire alive. Now Salman's father, he loved Salman very much. He loved him to the extent that he never wanted him to leave home. Because if Salman left home, then his father wouldn't see him. And by not seeing him, it would bring distress to his heart. He wanted him in front of his eyes all the time. That is the love that Salman's father had for him. It made him quite overprotective. So Salman used to be home all day. And eventually when he got older, his father gave him the responsibility of maintaining that fire. And his father used to go out in the day. His father was a wealthy man, an influential man. He had businesses around the city. He had farms outside the outskirts of the city. So he used to go take care of his business every day while Salman would stay at home. One day, the father of Salman was doing a construction project at their home. So there were workers at the home. So Salman's father did not want to leave the home while the workers were doing this construction. But at the same time, he needed to go out and tend to his businesses. He needed to go to his farms. He needed to take care of all of this. And of course, he can't be two places at the same time. So he needs to stay home to supervise the construction work, but also the business outside needs to be taken care of. So for the first time, 
Salman gave, Salman's father gave the responsibility to Salman that you go out and check out the farms and check out the businesses and make sure that everything is going okay. By this time, Salman, he was a teenager. He was around 16 or 17 years old. So his father felt that, okay, I can send Salman out and he can take care of this work. So for the first time, Salman actually ventures past his own home to go towards those farms that his father owned to see what was going on. So when he went outside, going towards the farm, he was amazed. You know, imagine you lived in a place and you stayed home your whole life and now finally you get to see the outside world. So this was a big deal for Salman. He was amazed by what he saw. The shops, the businesses, the scenery. And one of the places that he passed by was a church. The population of that area in Persia, the majority of them were Majus. They were Zoroastrians, fire worshippers. But there was a minority Christian population that lived there as well. This is before the time of the Prophet ﷺ. And these Christians that lived in this area, they were Unitarian Christians. Meaning they actually believed and practiced the concept of Tawheed. They worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And they believed in the true message of Isa alayhi salam. They believed in Isa alayhi salam as a messenger of Allah and not as the son of Allah. So these were Christians who were actually upon the right path. You could say that they were the Muslims of their time. They worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So Salman al-Farisi on the way to his father's farm, he passes by one of their churches and he hears the people in the church reciting the Injil. And he becomes mesmerized by this. Wow, this is something that's really beautiful. I've never heard anything like this before. So out of his curiosity, he actually goes and enters the church. And the people in the church, they welcome him. They say, yes, absolutely, come in. He asks questions. What were you reading? What is the religion that you follow? He asks questions. And he gets answers to these questions. They teach him about Tawheed. They teach him about Allah, the oneness of Allah. He spends the whole day with these people. He forgets to fulfill his father's responsibility, doesn't even go to the farm. He spends the whole day now at the church. And he asks the people of the church, after getting an introduction to this religion of Tawheed, he asks the people at the church, where did this religion originate? And where can I find the greatest scholars of this religion so I can learn more? So they tell him the greatest scholars of this religion are in Sham in the greater Syria area. This is basically where this religion spread and where it originated in Palestine and Sham area. So he spends the whole day with these people. Finally, sunset comes and Salman, of course, he didn't go to the farm. He heads back home and his father was worried by this time. It's dark now. He was expecting Salman to be back much earlier. But when he didn't come back, Salman's father act actually sent people to go out and look for him. But now Salman finally comes back in the evening. So his father asks him, we were so worried about you. Where were you? He, and Salman was honest. He didn't try to lie. He said, I passed by a church and I heard what they were reading. And I went in the church and I asked them questions about their religion. So then the father of Salman got worried. Like what's happening to my son? Is he going to leave our religion? So he tells Salman, our religion. The religion of fire worship is better than their religion. And Salman, he says, no, their religion is better than our religion. So now Salman's father is very worried. If Salman leaves the religion of, of the Majus, then Salman's father fears that this will be something that affects his reputation and the reputation of his family. He's the leader of the city. He's the most influential man in the village. So what would people say if his own son left the religion of the Majus? They are the family that's responsible for keeping the fire alive. And if the son of this man leaves their religion, he felt that it would be something that would destroy his reputation in the eyes of the people. So in order to prevent Salman from moving forward in learning more about this religion, Salman's father chains him up in the home so he cannot leave home now. He chains him up. 
But Salman is able to get a message to the church. Even though he's chained up, he is able to somehow get a message to the church that if any caravan from Syria is coming, because there used to be many caravans that used to go back and forth between Syria and Persia. They used to do business. These were two big empires at that time. The Persian Empire and the Byzantine Empire, which expanded into Syria. So Salman said, if any caravan is coming from Syria, then just get me a message. Let me know and I will find some way to escape from these shackles. And I want to join that caravan and I want to actually travel to Syria, travel to Sham in order to learn the religion of Christianity from the greatest scholars of the religion in that land. So this is the message that he gets to the church. They receive this message and they agree that they're going to help him. Eventually a caravan does come from Sham and the Christians of the church get a message to Salman that there's a caravan here and they're going to be going back to Sham in a few days after they finish their business here. So Salman is able to escape from the shackles and he goes to that caravan and he asks their permission. He wants to accompany them back to Syria and they give him permission to do this. So Salman basically he runs away from home. He leaves his family. He leaves the life of comfort that he knew in search for the truth. And he joins this caravan and he goes to Sham. When he reaches Sham, he asks, who is the most knowledgeable scholar in this land? And he is directed to the bishop of the main church. He goes to that bishop and he says, I want you to teach me the religion and I will be in your service. I want to spend all my time with you. I will serve you. I will do whatever work you need me to do, but I want to learn the religion from you. So the bishop agrees and Salman, he spends all of his time in service of this bishop. But living with the bishop and seeing the bishop in public and in private, he realizes, Salman realizes that this bishop is a munafiq. He's a hypocrite. He preaches something to his people and they respect him. But in reality, he practices the opposite of what he preaches. He used to call the people to give charity. He used to tell them, give in the way of Allah and we will distribute it to the poor. But when he would collect all of that charity, he would keep it for himself instead of distributing it to the poor. And Salman was witnessing all of this. So Salman developed a great hatred in his heart towards this man, not towards the religion because he knew the religion had nothing to do with the actions of this man. But he developed hatred towards this man in particular. Eventually the bishop died and the people were very sad. They considered him the most respectable scholar in the land. So they were ready to bury him. But before they buried him, Salman, he told the people, you know this person you, res you respected so much, he was actually a hypocrite. And they were shocked. They were saying, you have to bring proof. How can you make such, a, such an accusation? And then he said, I'll give you proof. All the charity that he collected from you and he said he's distributing it to the poor, he never distributed any of it. He used to store it and I know where he stored it. I can show you all of that charity that you gave. So they said, show us. So he took them to where this bishop used to store all of the charity and there were seven treasure chests full of jewelry and gold and silver. And these people who gave, thinking that they were giving sadaqah, they recognized their own jewels. The women, they had rings and, and necklaces and all of these type of jewels and they could recognize that these are the same exact jewels that we gave thinking that it was going to charity. So they realized that Salman was speaking the truth and this man was a munafiq, that this bishop was a hypocrite. So they said, we're not even going to bury him. He doesn't even deserve a proper burial. We will put his dead body on a cross and we will stone the dead body. And that is exactly what they did. Eventually this bishop was replaced with another bishop and Salman continued to serve him. And this one turned out to be a good man. This bishop, he was a righteous man and he followed the religion in the correct way. And Salman learned a lot from him, a righteous man. When the time of death for this bishop came, Salman said, I have learned so much from you, but now it seems that your time to leave this world has come. I want to continue on this journey, learning more. So who do you advise me to go to? And this man said, the people have corrupted our religion and corrupted our scriptures. Most of the people, they are not upon the right path. But there is one man I know who is still upon the right path and he is in, he is in Mausil. And if you go to him and learn from him, you can continue on your journey. So Salman, after this, this bishop dies, Salman, 
he goes to Mosul. So he came from Asbahan in Persia, in Iran. He went to Syria. Now he goes to Mosul in modern-day Iraq, continuing his journey. And he learns from the man over there. And he stays with him for some time. And again, he's a righteous man, a good man. And Salman learns a lot from him. The time for this man also comes to die. And Salman asks him, who should I learn from after you? And he said, I only know one man who is upon the way that we are upon. And he is in Misibin. That is on the border of Syria and Turkey. So after this man dies, Salman, he continues his journey. He goes to Nisibin and he learns from the man over there. When the time of death for that man goes, then he asks him, where should I go after you? He says, there's a man who is upon our way in Ammuriya. Ammuriya is further west in Turkey. So Salman goes to Ammuriya. Look at this journey. He's willing to go wherever he needs to go. From Iran to Syria to Iraq to the Syrian-Turkish border, then further west in Turkey. He goes, he takes all of these steps in search for the truth. He stays in Ammuriya for a longer time. And he started to work over there as well. And he accumulated some cattle as well, some cows and some sheep. And then death came. The time of death came for the scholar in Ammuriya as well. And before he died, Salman asked this man, the time has come for you as well. I want to continue upon my journey looking for the truth. Who should I go to after you? And this man says, I don't know anyone. I don't know anyone in the world who is left upon the path that we are upon. But I know that the time has come for a prophet who will come from the land of the Arabs. And he will migrate to a land between Harratain, between two black expanses of land. And that land that he will migrate to will be a land of palm trees. So land between two black expanses of land and in that land there are palm trees. If you can go to that land, go to that land and a prophet will appear in that land. And this prophet from our scriptures, there are three signs that this prophet will have. The first sign is that he does not accept charity for himself. The second sign is that he does accept gifts. If you give him a gift, he will accept it. But as for charity, he will not accept it for himself. And the third sign is that he has the seal of prophethood on his back. The Prophet ﷺ actually had a physical mark on his back between his shoulder blades. And this was known as the seal of prophethood. And this was mentioned in the previous scriptures. So look for this seal, this, this mark on his back. So these are the three signs that were given to Salman to look for in the prophet that will appear in the Arab lands. So eventually this man, this Christian scholar also dies. Salman, he stays in Ammuriya for a little longer and he continues to accumulate some wealth, some, some camels, some, some, some sheep, some cows. And eventually a caravan from the Arab lands comes to Ammuriya, from the Arab lands. So now he thinks this is my opportunity. I can join this Arab caravan and I can go into the land of the Arabs and search for that place the place of palm trees between the two black expanses of land and I can wait for this prophet to appear. So he asks the Arabs, the Arabs of this caravan, take me with you and I will give you all of my animals, all of the, this wealth that I have accumulated. You can have it all. I don't need it. I just want to go to the land of the Arabs. So this caravan, they agree to take him and they take him to the land of the Arabs. When they reach Wadi Al-Qura, which is north of Medina, they betray Salman and they sell him into slavery. They sell him into slavery. So now Salman has become a slave and he has to stay in Wadi Al-Qura for some time. And the man who bought him was a Jewish man. So he stays there in Wadi Al-Qura for some time as a slave. And then eventually his owner's cousin comes to visit him. And his owner's cousin was from the tribe of Banu Qurayza in Medina. He came to Wadi Al-Qura to visit his cousin. And he sees Salman, a strong man. And he asks his cousin, I want to buy this slave from you. So the cousin sells his slave to his cousin. And now this man from Medina, from Bani Qurayza, he is the new owner of Salman. And he takes him back to Medina. He takes him back to Medina. And as soon as Salman enters Medina, even though he enters as a slave, he's not a free man anymore. 
He recognizes the land immediately. It is between two black expanses of land and Medina is a land of palm trees. This is the place that I have been looking for. So even though he's a slave, Alhamdulillah, he's happy that he is in the land that he was seeking. So he works as a slave in Medina for years under this Jewish man. And in the meantime, the Prophet ﷺ has already received prophethood in Mecca. And he's receiving revelation in Mecca. But Salman in Medina doesn't know anything about what's going on in Mecca. Eventually, the Prophet ﷺ makes hijrah from Mecca due to the persecution of the Quraysh. He arrives in Medina. He arrives at Quba. And the day that the Prophet ﷺ arrived at Quba, Salman was working for his master on a tree. He was getting some dates from a tree. He was on the top of the tree. And his master was on the ground. And his master's uncle came to his nephew and said, there's a man who has come from Mecca and he is claiming that he is a prophet and he has arrived in Medina. He has arrived at Quba. This is a conversation be going on between the uncle and the nephew on the ground and Salman hears it. This is what he's been waiting for. He starts to shake. He almost falls down from the tree. He quickly gets down and he asks his master. He says, what did you say? What was your uncle saying to you? That a man has come to Medina and he's saying that he's a prophet? And then the master is very upset like, what is this? This is not your business. You're a slave. Your job is just to do what I command you to do. Don't ask me about these things. And he hits Salman and tells him to get back to work. But Salman is very excited. He finishes his work for that day. And in the evening, he asks his master for, per for permission to take care of some personal matters. His master gives him permission. So Salman goes to Quba to meet the Prophet ﷺ for the first time. He sees the Prophet ﷺ and he meets him. But before he accepts him, he wants to see if he fits these three signs that the scholar in Ammuriya told him about. So he brings some dates to the Prophet ﷺ and he says, I heard that you came from out of town. I have some dates that I would like to give you as a charity. This is just a test. I have dates that I want to give you as charity. So the Prophet ﷺ thanks him and he distributes those dates to his poor companions. And he does not eat any of those dates himself. So Salman notes that in his mind. He did not accept the charity for himself. The first sign is complete. The next day, Salman, he goes back with some dates again and he says, this is a gift, not charity. This is a gift from me to you. So the Prophet ﷺ thanks him. He distributes it to his companions and he eats it himself as well. The second sign is also there. He accepts gifts. Now the third sign would be a little bit more difficult to see. He needs to see the back of the Prophet ﷺ to see that seal of prophethood. So he's thinking, how can I do this? So one day there's a janaza at Baqi'ah. One of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ passed away. And there was a janazah. So Salman thinks, okay, this is a good opportunity. Everyone will be in the funeral procession. People, it will be very crowded, right? I might be able to, you know, pull down the upper garment of the Prophet ﷺ a little bit in the rush in the crowd. And I can just see that seal of prophethood. So during the funeral procession, Salman is right behind the Prophet ﷺ, very close to him. And the Prophet ﷺ realizes that someone is following him very closely from behind. And he understands that he's looking for something. He wants to see something. So the Prophet ﷺ himself, he shrugs his upper garment off of his shoulders so that Salman can actually see his back. So as the Prophet ﷺ shrugs his garment off of his shoulders, Salman sees the seal of prophethood. It is right there between the shoulder blades. Now he has seen all of the three signs. He knows this is the messenger of Allah. This is the one that I've been looking for. So he can't control his emotions anymore, Salman. So he starts to cry and he hugs the Prophet ﷺ from behind and he kisses his back. And the Prophet ﷺ lets him cry. And when he is able to finally compose himself, the Prophet ﷺ tells him, turn around, face me, look at me. So he turns around and he faces the Prophet ﷺ. And then the Prophet ﷺ tells him, tell me your story. What is your story? And Salman narrates the whole story from the beginning, from his childhood to the Prophet ﷺ. From his journey from Asbahan to Syria, back to Mosul, 
back to Nisibin, back to Ammuriya, then going to Wadi al qura being sold as a slave, then coming to Medina. He tells him the whole story. This whole story took place in a period that lasted over 30 years. Over 30 years, Salman is going from here to there in his journey upon this truth. And now he has finally found the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What emotions he felt at that time. And he told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his story. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam calls his sahaba. He says, come, listen to the story of Salman. He tells Salman to narrate the story again in the presence of the sahaba. And Salman then officially accepted Islam. He took the shahada and he became a great companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Amazing journey of Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu. And it shows that a person who is sincerely looking for the truth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring the truth to him. No matter what circumstance this person is in. If you're sincere and you're looking for the truth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will get the truth to you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to stay upon the path of guidance. May he increase us in guidance and may he increase us in taqwa. And may he allow us to live lives of submission to him. And when it's time for us to leave this world, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to to die a death in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ameen. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Azim wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bihadi Sayyid al-Mursaleen aqulu ma tasma'oon wa astaghfirullah al-Azim al-Jalil li wa lakum wa li jami'i al-Muslimin min kulli dham fastaghfiruhu innahu huwa al-Ghafur al-Rahim. الحمد لله على إحسانه والشكر له على توفيقه وامتنانه وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له تعظيما لشأنه وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله الداعي إلى رضوانه أما بعد My dear brothers and sisters, after Salman accepted Islam he became a companion of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم but he was still a slave so he could not participate in the battle of Badr he could not participate in the battle of Uhud because he was a slave the Prophet ﷺ had great love for Salman. He wanted to help Salman. So he said to Salman, make a contract with your master. Buy yourself out of slavery. Buy yourself out of slavery. Offer him, ask him what is his price and we're going to help you. Whatever your owner, whatever your master wants in order to free you, we will help you to accumulate that. So Salman goes to his master and he says, I want to make a contract. I want to buy myself out of slavery. So his master says, okay, but I will need 300 palm trees and 40 uqiyah of gold. Right? Uqiyah, it's a measurement of gold. It's a, it's a pretty big amount. So Salman, he tells the Prophet ﷺ, this is what he asked for. So the Prophet ﷺ addresses his companion and he says, A'inu akhakum, help your brother, help Salman. So some of the companions bring some of the companions brought small palm trees, some of them brought 10, some of them brought 20, some of them brought 30, until Salman was able to collect a total of 300 palm trees. Then the Prophet ﷺ told Salman, now dig the holes for those palm trees. 300 holes for 300 palm trees. Dig the holes and when you finish digging them, let me know. Tell me and I will place them myself in the holes. So the Prophet ﷺ himself with his blessed hands, he placed those palm trees into the ground, 300 palm trees. And Salman said, not one single one of them died. Every one of them grew, walhamdulillah. But now, there is still the issue of the gold. So it's a lot of gold. And in one of the expeditions, the Prophet ﷺ was brought some of the spoils of war to distribute. Amongst those spoils of war, there was a piece of gold in the shape of an egg. So the Prophet ﷺ says, bring Salman. Salman comes to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ gives him the egg. And he says, give this to your master. And Salman thinks it's, it's not very big. Is it going to reach the weight that is needed? He said, just go to your master and give it to him. So he gives the egg to his master. They weigh it and it is exactly the weight that was needed. So Alhamdulillah, Salman became a free man and he participated in all of the battles with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after that point. Walhamdulillah. Salman Al-Farisi Radiallahu Anhu Once he was with 
some of the Arabs and some of the Arabs who were with him were bragging about their lineage. This is something that the Arabs used to be known for. They would talk about their lineage, about their ancestors, about who they came from. Right? So they were bragging. Some of the Arabs were bragging about their lineage and their tribes. And they asked Salman, وَأَنْتَ يَا Salman, What is your lineage? And what is your ancestry? Tell us about it. And Salman, his, his ancestry is also very deep. That Persian ancestry. But he could have said, I am the son and the grandson of so and so and so and so. But no. What did he say? He said, Ana Salman ibn al-Islam. I am Salman, the son of Islam. I am Salman, the son of Islam. Kuntu dalan fahadani Allah. I was astray and Allah guided me. Wa kuntu faqiran faghnani Allah. And I was poor and Allah subhanahu wa taala made me rich with Islam. Alhamdulillah. This was the purity of the heart of Salman al farisi radiyallahu an. Years later, after the Muslims conquered the Persian Empire. During the Khilafah of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, Salman was appointed as the governor of al-Madain. And he returned to his homeland. After, after decades, he returned to his homeland with honor and with authority as a Muslim. Alhamdulillah. Salman was the first person to translate the Qur'an. He translated the Qur'an into the Persian language. The first translation of the Qur'an or part of the Qur'an. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewarded Salman for his... For his honesty and his sincerity and his integrity by making him one of the great companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspire us through this beautiful story and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us upon the path of our messenger, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ameen. هذا وصلوا وسلموا رحمكم الله على الرسول المجتبى والنبي المصطفى كما أمركم بذلك ربكم جل وعلا فقال عز من قائل إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على نبينا وحبيبنا محمد بن عبد الله وارض اللهم عن خلفائه الراشدين أبي بكر وعمر وعثمان وعلي وعن سائر الصحابة أجمعين وعن التابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وعنا معهم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله هيا على الصلاة هيا على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله استو استو اعتدلوا سد الخلل الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر الله أكبر سميع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر 
الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين إنا أعطيناك الكوثر فصل لربك وانحر إن شانئك هو الأبتر الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله استغفر الله استغفر الله استغفر الله لما أنت سلامك بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد Brother Salim Dadabai passed away. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive him and have mercy upon him. Allahumma ghafir lahu wa rahamhu wa afihi wa afu anhu wa akrim nuzulahu wa wasi'a mudkhalahu wa ghsilhu bil ma'i wa thilji wal barad wa naqihi min al-dhunubi wal khataya kama yunaqqa thawbu al-abiyadu min al-danas. Allahumma jazihi bil hasanati ihsana wa bil siyyati afu wa gufrana. May Allah forgive him and have mercy upon him and give patience to his family. Also, Brother Calvin Koo, he passed away. This brother, he took the shahada during the last days of his life. Walhamdulillah. Uh, he was bedridden and he was not even able to speak but alhamdulillah by sign language he was able to take the shahada alhamdulillah and he took the shahada before he passed away may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive him and have mercy upon him because of the fact that he accepted Islam at the end of his life and his family are not Muslim he did not have an Islamic uh, janazah so it is prescribed in these type of cases that we do the janazah for him, salatul janazah ala al-ghaib, that we do the absentee janazah prayer for him. So inshallah, we will do that now bi idhnillah. We'll pray the janazah prayer for our brother, brother Calvin Ku. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive him and have mercy upon him. Just a quick recap regarding how the janazah prayer is prayed. There are four takbirat. After the first takbir, we recite Surah Al-Fatiha. Of course, this is all silently. Everyone recites Surah Al-Fatiha. And after the second takbir, then we will say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad, similar to how you do in the, sh the tashahud of prayer. Then after the third takbir, we make dua for the one who passed away. You can say, Allahumma ghfir lahu warhamhu. Oh Allah, forgive him. Right? Even if you don't know, you know, long duas, if you just say, Allahumma ghfir lahu, and you keep repeating this, Oh Allah, forgive him. Oh Allah, forgive him. Allahumma ghfir lahu. This is okay. Then the final takbir, the fourth takbir, there's a short pause and there is taslim, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah on the right side only, inshallah. Barakallahu feekum. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. 